Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bookish Babbles, the podcast where we reread our favorite books and chat about them. I'm your host, Allison, and without further ado, let's get started. Welcome to episode 4 of Bookish Babbles. Today we're talking about chapters 11 to 13 of The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. We are officially on part 2 of the book, which is called The Prize. Uh, this week, Coriolanus gets serious about making sure Lucy Gray wins the Hunger Games. Someone returns from the hospital. Ooh. Lucy Gray debuts a new song. And the games are about to begin. Oh, hi Logan. <laughs> I'm uh I'm dog sitting for one of my neighbors right now and um the d- and Logan found a squeaky toy so yeah you're gonna hear that in the background for a while Logan what you doing the games are about to begin uh just a quick recap uh Clemencia got bit by Doctor Gall's mutant snakes and was in the hospital for days though everyone was told she has a bad flu uh Lucy Gray and Jessup are now officially allies. Uh, Arachne's funeral happens, an explosion in the arena happens while mentors give their tribute to Tor, uh, more tributes and mentors die as a result, and Lucy Gray saved Corio's life and he owes her. So w- with all that being said, let's dive in. Alright, so chapter 11 picks up exactly after where... um chapter 10 ended so i'm just gonna of course open with a reading because what else would i do <clears throat> lucy gray's words stung but on reflection were well deserved coriolanus had never really considered her a victor in the games it had never been part of his strategy to make her one he had only wished that her charm and appeal would rub off on him and make him a success even his encouragement to sing for sponsors was an attempt to prolong the attention she brought him Only a moment ago, her healed hands were good news because she could use them to play the guitar on interview night, not to defend herself from an attack in the arena. The fact that she mattered to him, as he claimed in the zoo, only made things worse. He should have been trying to preserve her life, to help her become the victor, no matter the odds. I meant what I said about you being the cake with the cream, Lucy Gray said. You're the only one who even bothered to show up, you and your friend Sejanus. You two acted like we were human beings. But the only way you can really repay me now is if you help me survive this thing. I agree. Stepping up made him feel a bit better. From now on, we're in it to win. So... Like I said in uh, last week's episode, I really loved like how that chapter ended and kind of leads into this chapter uh, because it changes their dynamic. Because before, as he said, Coriolanus' strategy with Lucy Gray was just to show her off to the audience as much as, as possible so it can reflect well on him so he could get the Academy Prize. But now they're playing to win. So stakes have gone up. They shake on it. Though her odds are better now since there are only uh, 14 competitors left. And Lucy Gray jokes that if he keeps her alive, she might just win by default. Which, yeah. Plus, um, she has Jessup as an ally. so she, And she'll be able to get sponsors. So things are, are looking up. Uh, Corio then asks her if she'll be able to kill someone. She says yes, she should be able to in self-defense, but as Coriolanus points out, this is this is the Hunger Games. Everything is self-defense. Uh, they agree that the best move for her would be to just avoid the others as much as possible and hopefully outlast them. So basically just go into hiding as much as she can, and then when she pops her head all up, Corio will send her food. And Lucy Gray also has this line on page 158 where she says, Enduring horrible things is one of my many talents, which that line just, that line made me want to give her a hug because, well, poor thing. And Lucy Gray says she has the perfect song for interview night and, and, uh, Corio again promises to find her a guitar. 
Uh, time's up. Uh, they're done meeting with the tributes. Mentors have to go to the high biology lab. And of course, Dr. Gall is there because who else would be there at this point? She's feeding a rabbit and she's back with the creepy lines. Uh, not lines. She's back with the creepy rhymes. Rhymes, lines, uh, tomato, tomato. On page uh, 159, um, the line she has is, Hippity hoppity, carrot or stick, everyone's dying, and you're... And Sejanus finishes with, feeling sick. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. So then, the gall then proceeds to taunt Mark Marcus. That's a typo in my notes. I <laughs> This is what I wrote in my notes. Gall then proceeds to taunt Marcus about the fact that Marcus is still missing. <laughs> Oh boy. Um, correction. Gaul proceeds to taunt Sejanus about the fact that Marcus is still missing. Good job, Allison, who wrote the notes. So the official word on Marcus is that he's currently uh, trapped underground but will be captured soon or he's already dead. Uh, my personal thoughts are that Marcus has already been captured and Gaul's uh, really getting a kick out of taunting Sejanus because... I can't uh, emphasize enough how much Gaul sucks as a human being. Logan, what you got? Oh, that's just a bone. Okay. Just making sure Logan had something he was supposed to. So, um, mm, Sejanus has similar suspicions as me and calls Dr. Gaul out on it, which is a really, uh, like, gutsy thing to do. Like, I, I can bear, I can, like, I can barely correct a, um, like, like a waiter if they get my drink order wrong. I can't imagine um, trying to correct Dr. Gall in anything. So, um, what was I saying? Oh, so, uh, and Coriolanus even has a moment of admiring Sejanus for his boldness, though I am also very nervous for him. Gall's probably wondering how she can torture him without getting in trouble, because, you know, he's still, Sejanus is still the son of a very wealthy man. Uh, oh no, Logan. Not the squeaky toy again. <laughs> I thought you were done. Hello. Now you... Okay. Nope. Now he just wants me to scratch his ear. Okay. That works for me. Um, what was I saying? Oh. Yeah, so Gaul probably thinking of a way to um, torture Sejanus without getting punished. Because he's still the son of a very wealthy man and money is power. So she, she can't... She can't directly hurt Sejanus or the Plints because she still wants to be able to be free and be able to create her mutts. Because she's crazy! Alright, so, and Sejanus has a really good speech on page uh, 159. Alright, so after um, Sejanus says that, that Marcus is probably probably like uh, captured and it's and it's under wraps um um he and he like asks and he kind of directly asks all this he says no don't answer Sejanus spat out he's either dead or about to be when you catch him and drag him through the streets in chains that is our right Dr. Gall countered. No, it isn't. I don't care what you say. You've no right to starve people, to punish them for no reason, no right to take away their life and freedom. Those are things everyone is bored with, and they're not yours for the taking. Winning a war doesn't give you that right. Having more weapons doesn't give you that right. Being from the capital doesn't give you that right. Nothing does. Oh, I don't even know why I came here today. Again, I appreciate Sejanus uh, continuing to call out the capital on its bullshit. Pardon my French. Um, Sej and after that outburst... Sejanus uh, tries to leave, but the door is locked due to new uh, security measures. Uh, Gaul then offers, though Reed threatens, to have Sejanus escorted to his father's offices. And the two have a stare down, and the atmosphere is now uh, quite tense. And Coriolanus ends up being the one to break the tension and invites Sejanus to sit down next to him. And then after that, the class has another uh, really interesting dis uh, discussion this time about the war and of course I have to do another reading I can't help it like this like these scenes like whenever 
like Dr. Gall is leading a class discussion. I feel like there's some of Suzanne's uh, best writing. So um, this conversation I'm about to read starts on page uh, 161. I thought the war was over, said Livia. She seemed angry, too, but not in the same way as Sejanus. Coriolanus guessed that she was just peeved about losing her strapping tribute. Did you, even after your experience in the arena, said Dr. Gall? I did, interjected Lysistrata. And if the war is over, then technically the killing should be over, shouldn't it? I'm beginning to think it will never be over, conceded Festus. The districts will always hate us, and we'll always hate them. I think you might be onto something there, said Dr. Gall. Let's consider for a moment that the war is a constant. The conflict may ebb and flow, but it will never really cease. Then what should be our goal? You're saying it can't be won? asked Lysistrata. Let's say it can, said Dr. Gall. What's our strategy then? Coriolanus pressed his lips together to keep from blurting out the answer. So obvious. Too obvious. But he knew Tigris was right about avoiding Dr. Gall, even if it might bring praise. As the class chewed over the question, she paced up and down the aisle, finally coming to a stop at his table. Mr. Snow, any thoughts on what we should do with our endless war? He comforted himself with the thought that she was old and no one lived forever. Mr. Snow, she persisted. He felt like he was the rabbit being prodded by her metal rod. Want to take a wild guess? We control it, he said quietly. If the war is impossible to end, then we have to control it indefinitely, just as we do now, with the peacekeepers occupying the districts, with strict laws, and with reminders of who's in charge, like the Hunger Games. In any scenario, it is preferable to have the upper hand, to be the victor rather than the defeated. Though in our case, decidedly less moral, Sejanus muttered. It's not immoral to defend ourselves, Livia shot back, and who wouldn't rather be the victor than the defeated? I don't know that I have much interest in being either, said Lysistrata. But that wasn't an option, Coriolanus reminded her, given the question. Not if you think about it. Not if you think about it, eh, Casca? said Dr. Gall as she headed back up the aisle. A little thought can save a lot of lives. Uh, Dean Highbottom doodled on his list. Maybe Highbottom's just, just as much a rabbit as I am, Coriolanus thought, and wondered if he was wasting his time worrying about him. So, yeah, really interesting and, like, complex discussion about war. Like, hey, hi, Logan. <laughs> And all of this just leads to Dr. Gall giving them another assignment. Uh, this time, they have to write an essay about everything that they find attractive about war. And this time, it'll be done individually. Uh, Gall points out that the problem with group projects is that one person usually ends up doing most of the work. And she winks at Corio as she says that. And no, please don't ever wink. That's horrifying. Um... Anyway, uh, so the essay is due at the mentor meeting on Sunday. Class dismissed. Sejanus tells uh, Corio that he needs, needs to stop rescuing him. Cor and Corio replies with, I can't seem to help it. <laughs> Don't worry, Sejanus. By the end of the book, he will uh, be doing the opposite of saving you. But more on that later. Uh, Sejanus uh, then states um, the obvious, that Gaul is evil and needs to be stopped. And Coriolanus is pretty sure that plan wouldn't go well, and he's, he's right. And unfortunately, I'm, yeah, I'm inclined to agree with him on that. And Sejanus wishes that he and his family would uh, move back to Chu, even though they wouldn't exactly be welcomed back with open arms. And uh, on page uh, 163, Sejanus has this line where he says, Being capital is going to kill me. I, I mean, d d we'll get to that. I wrote in my notes, insert agonized screams here. Ah! There we go. Hi, Logan. He found a bone now. Anyway, uh, Coriolanus tells Sejanus not to do anything rash, because he wants Sejanus around in case he has to call in a favor. Because remember, Coriolanus likes to keep people around when he thinks he has something to gain. And then ask Sejanus for, if he has a guitar. He does not. 
so he has to devote the rest of the afternoon to finding one. In the end, he goes to Pluribus Bell, and just for as a refresher, Pluribus Bell is the one he he bought all those cans of lima beans from during the war. So every time I reread this book, I feel like I gain a new love and or appreciation for a new character. Like um, last time I remember really loving Jessa, Bliss Estrada, and even Festus a little bit. Like, and like I said earlier, High Bottom is a character that I'm just re really paying attention to this time around more. And, but, you know, I still don't, I don't like love him the way I love Jessup, like, or Lucy Gray. But, uh, Pluribus Bell, however, I really am kind of growing fond of this time reading around and I really respect him. So... We get a little, so in the scene, we get a little tidbit of what his life has been like since the end of the war. And it hasn't changed that much. He still deals in the black market goods, and some items are a bit more luxurious now since District 1 is starting to make them again. So they're slowly becoming available to people in the capital. Not that the Snows could afford any of this stuff right now. And Tigress still goes to him to trade uh, ration coupons for things like uh, meat and coffee and I don't know about you guys but coffee is very essential for me like food like like survival things I need food water air shelter coffee coffee is an essential <laughs> so uh, the reason and the reason I respect uh, Pluribus so much is because he stays out of people's business and is known for his discretion like he like, he knows about the Snow's uh, money problems, but never told anyone, and never makes him feel inferior, so he, so he sounds like the kind of person I'd want to hang out with, so thank you for existing, Pluribus, in this fictional book. <laughs> so, uh, Pluribus loans him a nice guitar for Lucy Gray to use, and, uh, Coriolanus sa then says, um, thanks him, says he ho hopes that Pluribus will reopen his club. Oh! You want to go outside? Okay. Uh, impro Be right back, guys. All right, we're back. Uh, Logan is currently outside on his leash. He loves being outside, so he'll be there for a little while. Uh, where was I? Uh, Pluribus loans him the guitar for Lucy Gray to use. Uh, Coriolanus says he hopes Pluribus will open his club again. Says he'll be a regular. Okay, I think this is where I was. And Okay, so in this moment, we learn from uh, Pluribus that Corio's father used to be a regular at his club with his friend Casca Highbottom? What? So, naturally, uh, Coriolanus thinks about this for the rest of the night and wants more details because, you know, this man who clearly hates him so much and despises him, like, what do you mean he was best friends with his father? What happened between them? We don't know. But, but yeah, he ha he'll have to wait till later to find out, and us too. So the next few days are devoted to uh, preparing for interview night, which is on Saturday night. Each uh, mentor tribute pair is given a classroom to prepare and get ready in during those days. Uh, Tigress loans Lucy Gray an old dress to wear while she cleans up the uh, rainbow dress. And she also gives Lucy Gray a bar of soap and a piece of cake. Love, love Tigress. So, um, he get so Coriolanus, uh, gives Lucy Gray the guitar that Pluribus loaned them. And I love, like, this description of just how happy she is with the guitar on, like, on top of page 167 it says the loving way she handled the guitar as if it were a sentient being gave him a hint of a past so unlike his own he had trouble imagining it she took her time tuning the instrument and then played song after song seemingly as starved for the music as for the meals he brought yeah again as someone who like loves music and plays a few instruments i just love that description how happy she got like this is probably the happiest she's been in days like you know since the reaping most likely and and like whenever i've had like you know a day a stressful day and i feel and i feel down like just playing my just playing any of my instruments does like boost my mood and my overall mental health so yeah, if you, any of you out there playing an instrument, I recommend picking it up and playing it for at least like 20 minutes. I, I almost guarantee your mood will improve. That's just from my personal experience. 
So now it's interview night. Woo! <laughs> so it kicks off in front of a live audience. The interviews are being hosted by the Capital TV weatherman, Lucky Flickerman. Um, that name should sound familiar to anyone who's seen the movies or read the original trilogy because Flickerman is obviously the same la surname as Caesar Flickerman, played by the amazing Stanley Tucci in the movies, um, who is like the host and does all the interviews in the for the tributes in the 74th games. So... A quick, just a quick note and comment I want to make about Lucky. So a critique that I often hear about Ballad is just like all the, like the little connections and Easter eggs to the original series. And it's like, and the biggest critique comes from, from Lucky. I personally, I don't mind because if we had someone, I don't know, if we had someone with the last name like Everdeen or Malark, then I could, then I could see how that would feel too fan service -y. I don't think that's a real word but I'm using it and I do understand how having like another tv host character with the surname Flickerman feels too like on the nose but with all we but we all know that nepotism runs amok in our society especially in the entertainment industry so I, I personally have no problem believing that Caesar is like a son or nephew of Lucky or something and plus, we've already seen that, like, mentors, a lot of mentors very likely got their mentorship not just based on their merits alone, but because, you know, of who their parents are. So, yeah, no no problem believing that Lucky and Caesar would be related in some way. Anyway, back to the interview. Uh, Lucky welcomes the crowd, explains how the sponsorships would work and how the, the betting system works. Uh, then he does a magic trick by having a pigeon fly out of his sleeve. Woo! And of the mentor tribute pairings that are able to present, um, only half of them do. Uh, Corio asks to go last because he knows Lucy Gray will steal the show. Uh, mentors offer background information about their tribute and tries to add something memorable and ask for sponsorships. Uh, here's what some of them do. Uh, Jessup lifts uh, Liz Estrada over his head while she sits in a chair. Uh, Kirk, who's the boy from 3, claims he can start a fire with his glasses, which um, I wear glasses and I've never uh, tried to do that. Um, probably won't. Uh, Bobbin from 8, he knows uh, five different ways to kill someone with a sewing needle. Uh, Bobbin's mentor is uh, Juno Phipps. I think that's how you say it. And quick note about Juno, um, she's a member of one of the Capitol's, like, founding families, so, like, one of, like, old elite money families. And just interesting thing to note is that she was also, like, disappointed originally with her tribute assignment, just like Corio. And believe she believes that given her last name and who her family is, she deserves better, so ide ideally, like, a tribute from one or two. And it's, it's just a really small detail, but I think it's noteworthy because it contributes to Coriolanus's worries that, you know, the old elite families might be fading from significance, hence why he didn't get a tribute from one or two. And uh, Coral, who's from four, uh, makes a case for herself being a contender because she can wield a trident very well and demonstrates her skill uh, with a broomstick. And uh, Tanner from 10 uh, talks about, like, slaughterhouse techniques, and he goes on too long because Lucky has to cut him off when they run out of time. And at that point, he gets the most applause so far for the night. Uh, Dill, the girl from 11 is 6, so she can't really do anything. And Lucy Gray is back wearing her rainbow dress. Tigress managed to work her magic and looks as good on reaping days. So again, Tigress is a superhero. <laughs> uh, she and Coriolanus are wearing matching colored roses, which really pleases Corio because he loves people to remember that she belongs to him. And gag, no, gross. Ugh. And real quick on a uh, page uh, 169, I just wanted to read this like quick bit of dialogue between them i think your odds get better by the minute said coriolanus adjusting a hot pink rosebud in her hair it matched the one on hit on his lapel just in case anyone needed a reminder of who lucy gray belonged to 
Well, you know what they say. The show's not over until the Mockingjay sings, she said. The Mockingjay, he laughed. Really, I think you're just making these things up. Not that one. A mocking, a Mockingjay's a, f a bona fide bird, she assured him. And it sings in your show? Not my show, sweetheart. Yours. The Capitals, anyway, said Lucy Gray. I think we're up. Yeah. Like... And, like, this is a saying she constantly brings up, so I just wanted to make note of it in this conversation. So, what, so like Lucy Gray said, they're up. So, when uh, Coriolanus and Lucy Gray take the stage, they're greeted with applause. Corio introduces himself and then steps back so Lucy Gray can sing. Alright, so this um, scene at the end of chapter 11 is one of my favorites throughout the whole book. Like, I can't wait to see it brought to life on screen, and I'm completely obsessed with the song she sings. I mean, it's hard for me to pick a favorite, but if I had to pick one, it would be uh, this one. So, naturally, I will link some covers in the show notes that fans have done. Uh, but I'm also going to do a little something different to end this chapter. So, I'm going to start reading at the top of page uh, 170, and then I'm going to sing a cover of the ballad of... Lucy Gray Baird using um, Maya Wynn's version. And then I'll read the last two paragraphs of the chapter. And then right after, right after that, we'll take a break. I hope you enjoy it. Good evening, she said. I'm Lucy Gray Baird of the Covey Bairds. I started writing this song back in District 12 before I knew what the ending would be. It's my words set to an old tune. Where I'm from, we call it a ballad. That's a song that tells a story, and I guess this is mine. The Ballad of Lucy Gray Baird. I hope you like it. Coriolanus had heard her sing dozens of songs over the past few days, full of everything from the beauty of springtime to the heart-wrenching despair of losing her mama, lullabies and toe-tappers, laments and ditties. She solicited his opinion, weighing his response to each song. He thought they'd settled on a charming thing about the wonder of falling in love, but a few bars into this ballad, he knew this was nothing she'd rehearsed. The haunting melody set the tone, and her words did the rest as she began to sing in a voice husky from smoke and sadness. When I was a babe, I fell down in the hollow Take that and more when I go 
to my grave. It's sooner than later that I'm six feet under. It's sooner than later that you'll be alone. So who will you turn to tomorrow? I wonder for when the bell rings, lover, you're on your own. When the bell rings, lover, you're on your own. I am the one. Will you let see you weeping? I know the soul that you struggle to save. Too bad I'm the bed that you lost in the reaping. Now what will you do when I go to my grave? You could hear a pin drop in the auditorium when she finished. Then there were a few sniffles, some coughing, and finally Pluribus's voice shouting out, Bravo! from the back of the auditorium and the thunderous applause that followed. Coriolanus knew it had hit home, this dark, moving, far too personal account of her life. He knew the gifts would pour into the arena for her, that her success, even now, re reflected back on him, making it his success. Snow lands on top and all that. He knew he should be elated at this turn of events and jumping up and down inside while presenting a modest please front. But what he really felt was jealous. All right, we're back. I hope you guys enjoyed the cover I did. Uh, so naturally, right after that, I'm going to follow up with uh, reading the opening page of chapter 12. <clears throat> and last but least, District 12 girl, she belongs to Coriolanus Snow. Things might have been quite different if you hadn't landed your little rainbow girl. The truth is, we were all so busy killing each other that we forget to have fun. She knows, though, your girl. His girl. His. Here in the capital, it was a given that Lucy Gray belonged to him, as if she'd had no life before her name was called out at the reaping. Even that sancti sanctimonious Sejanus believed she was something he could trade for. If that wasn't ownership, what was? With her song, Lucy Gray had rep repudiated all that by fe by featuring a life that had nothing to do with him and a great deal to do with someone else. Someone she referred to as lover, no less. And while he had no claim on her heart, he barely knew the girl. He didn't like the idea of anyone else having it either. Although the song had been a clear success, he felt somehow betrayed by it, even humiliated. Lucy Gray rose and took a bow, then extended her hand to him. After a moment's hesitation, he joined her at the front of the stage while the applause built to a standing ovation. Pluribus led the cries for an encore, but their time had expired, as Lucky Flickerman reminded them, so they, had, so they took a final bow and exited the stage hand in hand. As they reached the wings, she started to release him, but he tightened his grip. So, sounds like someone's jealous. Uh, but in all seriousness, this passage is really disturbing. Because Coriolanus' uh, possessiveness of Lucy Gray is uh, popping his ugly head out again. And like, it, like it's to the point where he doesn't like the idea of her having a life or identity outside of him. Especially in, the, in a romantic sense. Uh, it reminds me of those, like, uh, quote-unquote, nice guys uh, who idealize whichever girl they're crushing on, but then as soon as she shows a flaw or does something unexpected that doesn't live up to the ideal, he turns on her. 
Like, uh, those are the vibes I just get from choreo in this moment. Also, I'm like 99.9% sure if Lucy Gray heard those thoughts uh, he was having about her, she would want to get as far away from him as possible. Because I think it's clear at this point that Lucy Gray values uh, freedom and the ability to express herself. So the last thing she would want is to fit anyone's ideal of her. And uh, those values we see become crystal clear later in the book, but we're not there yet. Anyway, uh, Lucy Gray and Corio, they take their bow, leave the stage. I just uh, read all that. And Coriolanus admits that he was surprised uh, by the song she sang since it wasn't one of the ones she had practiced during their prep time. Uh, she explains that the song is essentially meant uh, to be a message for the covey back home uh, since they're the only ones um, she cares about receiving it. She tells them that her being a tribute wasn't an accident and that the song is basically her way of telling them that and... You know, it was kind of hinted to us from the beginning that her being a tribute wasn't an accident, that the mayor rigged it for some reason, although we still have yet to learn all the details of why he would rig it. But uh, she also, uh, Lucy Gray also mentions that her cousin, uh, Maud Ivory, can memorize a song just after one listen, and I'm jealous. Like, I wish I could do that. It takes me, um, countless listens and reading the lyrics to memorize just one song um the, after that conversation uh two male peacekeepers come to escort her away and corio notes how friendly they are acting toward her and he remembers that the peacekeepers in 12 acted in a similar way at the reaping and this leads him to wonder how friendly she can be which rude how dare you, sir? You don't know her life. You don't know her whole history. Uh, you have no right to judge her. So, uh, go F off. And again, somebody's jealous. Very rude of him. And Coriolanus' thoughts only continue to get more unpleasant. And the best way to show that is, of course, to read at the top of page 174. So after Lucy Gray is escorted away... He swallowed his, pe his peevishness and accepted the congratulations that were pouring in from all sides. They helped to remind him that he was the real star of the evening. Even if Lucy Gray was confused on the issue, in the eyes of the Capitol, she belonged to him. What point would there be in crediting a district tribute? This held true until he ran into Pluribus, who gushed, What a talent! What a natural she is! If she manages to survive, I'm determined to headline her in my club. That sounds a bit tricky. Won't they send her home? said Coriolanus. I have one or two favors I could call in, he said. Oh, Coriolanus, wasn't she stellar? I'm so glad you got her, my boy. The snows were due a piece of good luck. Silly old man, with his ridiculous powdered wig and his uh, decrepit cat. What did he know about anything? Coriolanus was about to set the record straight when Ceteria appeared and whispered in his ear, I think the prize is in the bag, and he let it go. And another reason for me to strongly detest Coriolanus, because like I said earlier, Pluribus is a character who's growing on me this time around reading it. Like, this is a man who essentially kept you fed, Corio, uh, during the war, and Con and who continues to show you respect and courtesy, unlike most of your peers, w if they found out you were broke. Also, I think that this whole scene could be really well done on screen. Like, I'm imagining uh, Lucy Gray singing the song, it's beautiful, the audience cheers, and then it slows down, and the cheers get, like, muffled and, you know, more in the distance. And then the camera, like, focuses in on Coriolanus's face and we see just like how displeased and jealous he is in that moment and even when he's getting all this praise because in that moment it looks like he's getting everything he originally wanted at the beginning of the story but now he can't enjoy or relish in it because now there's this new thing that thing being lucy gray that he wants but feels out of reach and Anyway, I'm excited to see what they do with that because, you know, I trust Francis Lawrence to do something amazing with the material. So, 
back to the story. Uh, Tigress and Coriolanus walk home together. They talk about Lucy Gray's song, and Corio tells Tigress that he was bothered by some of Lucy Gray's lyrics, particularly the line about living by her charms. Charms. And Tigress, being the amazing human being she is, defends Lucy Gray and points out it's it's a performer. That line could mean anything. And I'm slowly realizing how much of a Tigress stan I've become. Hashtag Tigress deserves better. Um, anyway, I'm going to read the conversation between she and, uh, Co- uh, and Coriolanus that they have on page uh, 176. Because I feel like this is uh, the first like real moment of tension between the cousins. And again, I'm sorry for all the readings this episode. But gosh dang it, it's Suzanne's fault for being such a good writer. <laughs> So the conversation starts with Tigress saying, um, we all did things we're not proud of, meaning during the war. You didn't? You didn't, he said. Didn't I? Tigress spoke with an uncharacteristic bitterness. We all did. Maybe you were too little to remember. Maybe you didn't know how bad it really was. How can you say that? That's all I remember, he shot back. Then be kind, Corio, she snapped, and try not to look down on people who had to choose between death and disgrace. Tigress's rebuke shocked him, but less than her alluding to behavior that might be considered a disgrace. What has she done? Because if she'd done it, she'd done it to protect him. He thought about the morning of the reaping, when he'd casually wondered what she had to trade in the black market, but he had never taken that seriously. Or hadn't he? Would he have just preferred not to know what sacrifices she might be willing to make for him? Her comment was vague enough, and so many things were beneath the snow that he could say, as she had of Lucy Gray's song. Well, that could be anything. Did he want to know the details? No, the truth was he did not. Yep, you better feel guilty, Corio. So we obviously, so obviously we know that somewhere down the line in the future, their relationship falls apart to the point where Tigress helps the rebels take him down. And I wonder if this moment kind of helped lay the groundwork even subconsciously for that rift, rift to start forming between them. Like, I wonder if uh, Coriolanus will use this moment in the future to tell himself that Tigress isn't quote unquote worthy to be a snow because you know she disgraced herself but uh this is just me speculating but i just find these moments really interesting because we know how this story will end between them and it's interesting to see like how it could start so they go home and hey what do you know the elevator works now and at first they're excited but it's also a little bit worrying because they realize that this could mean that the owners are making the place nicer oh hi logan the the owners are making the place nicer so that they could attract you know wealthy buyers and after all we learned from earlier in the book from sejanus that that some families won't be able to afford the new property taxes and will have to move so they move out richer people will move in obviously no idea why i'm explaining this in detail oh logan wants to go out again be right back Okay, I'm back. What was I saying? Elevator's working. They're worried. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, they're in the apartment. Uh, Grandmam, she had stayed up to wait for them. And again, she compliments Lucy Gray, though it's still kind of a backhanded compliment that made me laugh a little bit. So at the top of page um, 178, when talking about Lucy Gray, the Grandmam says, She's a sad, trashy little thing, your girl, but oddly appealing in her way. Perhaps it's her voice. It gets inside a person somehow. Uh, so Coriolanus then stays up to write the essay that Gaul assigned because it's due the next day. And huh, writing an essay at the last minute, definitely not something I'm familiar with as a former English major. <clears throat> Moving on. Uh, so naturally, the thing that often happens, so I'm told, when you're writing at the last minute, again, no experience whatsoever. <clears throat> uh Coriolanus is kind of struggling to begin to write and Tigress helps him brainstorm ideas and she said she liked kind of like the ceremony and spectacle part of war 
and then she reminisces about the time they got a turkey. So, a little bit of history uh, during the war. Um, when, so, the December 15th was declared National Heroes Day, and this was after uh, Coriolanus' father had died. There was a TV special to honor fallen soldiers, and since the Snows uh, were a family with an important fallen soldier, they were given a frozen 20-pound turkey, mint jelly, and a can of salmon. Uh, Tigress cooked it, and they had a nice dinner, even invited Pluribus. So Coriolanus ends up writing about the like you know, the more fun ish parts of the war, and he isn't ultimately satisfied with his work, especially when he thinks about all the stuff that's happened in the past couple of weeks. He loved it when the capital won. He loved seeing the rebels punish, and he loved the control that the capital gained with that victory. Cause again, he loves control. So that morning, uh, the mentors gather for a Sunday meeting. Uh, Coriolanus has a moment of reflection where he wonders how they all would have turned out if not for the war. Uh, he definitely wouldn't be broke and an orphan. He also feels a bit guilty for not visiting Clemencia, worries she's turning into a snake, worries that if he sets foot in a hospital in the hospital, uh, he would be taken into a lab to be experimented on like Clemencia, then quickly realizes he's just being paranoid. Because, after all, if they really wanted to trap him in the hospital, they would have done it when he was staying there after the arena explosion. And, of course, at this meeting, our high bottom and Gaul, go figure. And if you want any more proof that Gaul is evil, we find out that she's a morning person. Oh, no. <laughs> Like, okay, no offense to any of the crazy people out there who are morning people listening, but seriously, how do you guys do it? Like, I'm I'm about as opposite as you can get when waking up first thing in the morning. According to my family, I'm known to glare at people <laughs> when they talk to me and I haven't had coffee yet. I'm sorry to everyone who's seen me first thing in the morning. <laughs> Anyway, um, High Bottom is not a morning person, so obviously he's less evil. <laughs> um, so we then learn that the betting odds are in. So far, Tanner and Jessup are the favored to win, but Lucy Gray has the most gifts so far. And this, of course, kicks off another class discussion with Gall. So Gall asks the class why they think so many people are giving Lucy Gray gifts despite the fact that many of them don't think she can actually win. Festus says that uh, people love to back a long shot, and he sees it all the time in dog fights. And as Seneca Crane says in the movie, everyone loves an underdog. Um, then they dive into the essays, and everyone shares parts of what they wrote. Uh, some, some of the things that are brought up are just stuff like admiring the soldier's courage and the bond formed between the soldiers. Basically, a lot of romantic ideas and liking the feeling of being part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, Coriolanus, on the other hand, feels disconnected from all the quote-unquote romantic ideas. And as much as I hate agreeing with Coriolanus on anything, I do think that more of us should have this kind of unromantic view of war. Because if, I don't know, if you're not careful, it's easy to look back on war through that romantic lens. And Hollywood war movies are very guilty of this. And not that there's anything wrong with watching those movies. I just think that it's important to remember like the true gravity of war. Which is why I love the, um, the Hunger Games series. Because never once do I think Suzanne ever glamorizes war she paints an honest picture of it and how it like deeply affects everyone involved even if they're not on a battlefield and Cor Coriolanus has this line on page 182 that kind of stuck out to me he says um, courage in battle was often necessary because of someone else's poor planning and I don't know, this just makes me think of how important it is for those in power to not be so so careless because there are real people with families and loved ones who are putting their lives on the line. So, uh, basically, if, if you're going to start a war, it better be for a damn good reason. Because uh, that decision will ultimately be extremely costly. And 
enough of my preaching. Uh, back to Corio's thoughts. So um, he describes um, his desires being about a need for control and very little to do with nobility, and at least he's self-aware in that regard. Uh, he thinks um, all the victory parades are a waste of resources, and when it's his turn, he didn't share any of those thoughts out loud. He just shares the part about the turkey. Uh, Gall asks if there's more he wants to say. He says no, but she knows that he's lying. But let's it go for now. Uh, Sejanus says the only thing he liked about the war was being back in two, and that the war had provided a chance to right some wrongs, and ultimately it didn't, and things in the districts are worse than ever. Uh, the class naturally does not like this answer, and Coriolanus feels angry too, because the way he sees it, there it takes two sides to start a war, and from his understanding, the rebels were the ones who started it, and the war also made him an orphan, so it is understandable why he feels so bitter. And then Sejanus then asks Gaul what she liked about the war, and on page 183, the answer she gives is, I love how it proved me, me right. Uh, but now it's lunchtime, so no time to elaborate on that. Uh, Coriolanus uh, forgot to pack food, and it isn't provided because it's Sunday, so he sits around and just listens to people's conversations. He hears hilarious. I don't know if it's pronounced hilarious, hilarious, whatever. Hilarious Heavens B uh, complains about his tribute, um, Wobi, who's the girl from 8. And he says that she has no personality and doesn't have any sponsors so far and says that he hopes at the very least she can make it to the top 12 so he won't be too embarrassed. And I think Coriolanus describes hilarious really well on page 184 when he... He says, like, no matter his advantages, Hilarious always seems to feel oppressed. I like this line because I feel like we all know someone like this. You know, someone who in reality has a lot of privileges, but they just love being able to complain. <laughs> oh, boy. So, uh, after lunch, uh, Satyria takes the mentors over to the Capitol News Station. Uh, Coriolanus is disappointed by the scene, by the behind-the-scenes setup. I thought it would be fancier. No worries. It gets a lot fancier in the future. You'll contribute to that. Uh, the game makers are excited by the new elements being introduced that year and are testing the new drones. And the drones are basically programmed to find, uh, to find the recipients by facial recognition. And they can only carry one item at a time. And if I remember correctly from the original series, I kind of think that's how... It works. I don't know about the facial recognition part, but I'm pretty sure in the original series, the drones that the sponsor gives can only take one item at a time. But eh, we'll get there when we get there. And Lucky Flickerman set to host. Uh, so Coriolanus learns that he's slotted for an interview at 8.15 the next morning. Um, and Lucky says it's to make sure they can get him before his tribute buys it. And that comment stings the the most because like and like in that moment it really sinks in for him that lucy gray isn't seen as a contender because it's one thing to hear it from gall or high bottom whom he views as these like antagonists in his life but it feels a lot different coming from you know goofy guy like lucky so corio goes home and gets ready for his uh, final meeting with lucy gray and emotions and anxiety are building up he's realizing that he has he really has grown fond of Lucy Gray and really doesn't want her to die. He wants to give something to her but is struggling cuz you know in his mind what's the use of a gift if she can't use it to defend herself. Tigress makes one more meal for Lucy Gray. Corio tops it with a peach crimson colored rosebud cuz he knows she loves color. Which actually this is a sweet gesture. Uh, Tigress is rooting for Lucy Gray. The Grand Mam is sorry that she has to die. Again, she Lucy Gray is very good at collecting comments from the Grand Mam. And the mentors get to Heaven's Bee Hall. Uh, Lysistrata admits to Coriolanus that she's grown fond of Jessup. Same girl, same. Uh, Corio wonders uh, if she saw Lucy Gray save him in the arena since she had been closest to them because... 
he goes into his last 10 minutes with Lucy Gray determined for it to be about a winning strategy and doesn't quite go according to that plan. So he gives her the food. Lucy Gray mentions that Jessup has been acting weird and that he stopped eating. Then again, everyone's acting weird in their own way. And this and Lucy Gray tells him that the previous night Reaper had apologized to everyone personally, saying he's sorry that he has to kill them and promises to make it up to them by taking revenge on the Capitol. It, a bit presumptuous that he'll be the victor, but still he was being I think he's being kind of honorable in in his in his way in that moment. So uh, good for you, Reaper. Uh, though how he plans to enact revenge on the Capitol is still unclear. And Jessup, as a response, spit in Reaper's face. Uh, Lucy Gray had simply replied by saying, "Not over till the Mockingjay sings." And everyone is understandably reeling. Lucy Gray finally cries and has a mini breakdown. And uh, who wouldn't in that moment? And Corio reassures her that she can do it and gives her his mother's compact. And because it's the end of a chapter, I have to do a reading because this is another important moment. Alright, so this is on page uh, 191. Sorry, I mean Lucy Gray's line where she says... Oh, I couldn't take it. It's too fine. It's enough you offered it, Coriolanus. Are you sure? He asked, teasing her a bit. He smoothly clicked the latch and held it up so she could see her reflection in the mirror. Lucy Gray drew in a quick breath and laughed. Well, now you're playing on my weakness. And it was true. She was always so careful with her appearance. Not vain, really, just conscious. She noticed the empty well where the cake of powder had sat an hour earlier. Did there used to be powder here? There did, but, began Coriolanus, he paused. If he said it, there was no going back. On the other hand, if he didn't, he might be losing her for good. His voice dropped to a whisper. I thought you might want to use your own. Dun dun dun, what does all this mean? We're gonna have to find out in the next chapter, so we'll take a break and unpack all that. back so hope everyone had a good break i'm back at my house now the neighbor's dog i was watching he's all set for the night i put my own dog ray out for the night so woo, we're good to go okay so chapter 13 uh opens with lucy gray understanding the significance of the gift coriolanus just gave her which only proves how smart she is because I definitely didn't get it the first time I read the book. So they use up the rest of their time to talk about the layout of the arena, but but then um, time's up. Oh no. And Coriolanus and Lucy Gray embrace and because of the significance of this moment that of course means it's time for me to do another reading the so the first of uh, full paragraph on page 193 then she gave him a kiss not a peck a real kiss on the lips with hints of peach and powder the feel of her mouth soft and warm against his own sent sensation surging through his body rather than pulling back he held her even tighter as the T as the taste and touch of her made his head spin. So this is what people were talking about. This was what made them so crazy. When they finally broke apart, he drew a breath as if surfacing from the depths. Lucy Gray's lashes fluttered open and the look in her eyes matched his own. They simultaneously leaned in for another kiss when peacekeepers laid their hands on her and led her away. Again, this is kind of a sweet and romantic moment between them, and it kind of makes me root for them, which is so weird because never in a million years did I think, you know, I could root for Snow for anything. 
So uh, Coriolanus feels giddy the whole way home, though he's also a bit anxious because he definitely crossed some sort of line, and not just with a kiss, but also because he suggested that Lucy Gray should fill the compat with rat poison, and as a result, he decided not to tell anyone. When he goes home, he does tell Tigris about the kiss, and then we get a brief history of Coriolanus's quote-unquote romantic history, uh, which is that he doesn't have much experience with romance and girls, and a big reason for that is because he didn't want to get too close with anyone so they wouldn't find out about the snow's financial problems, so he had to keep any admirers he had at an arm's length. And he also did this because of what a tigress went through during her last year at the academy. So during her last year, a tigress fell in love hard with someone and was really happy in that relationship. However, uh, the reason that the relationship ended was because tigress never brought her partner home to the apartment. So, you know, they saw it as a lack of commitment to the relationship. So the two of them broke up and which is so sad. And another reason I just want to give tigress a hug. And by the way, side note, in the passage um, where we're told about this relationship, the text never specifies the gender of the person that Tigris fell in love with. So I'm going to use it as proof that Tigris is bisexual. Feel free to agree or disagree with me on that. Anyway, uh, we also learn that Festus uh, once set Corio up, like kind of on a dare, Basically, uh, Corio met up with the girl behind the train station in an alley, and he doesn't remember much, mostly because he was drunk on Posca, and he never even learned her name, so real classy move. But it was like, a, I'm pretty sure this was the only time he ever did something like that, but it earned him, like, a reputation as being a player, quote unquote. And right after learning uh, that history, at the bottom of page 194, we get. Uh, more thoughts on Lucy Gray. Interesting thoughts he has. But Lucy Gray was his tribute, headed into the arena, and even if the circumstances were different, she'd still be a girl from the districts, or at least not capital, a second-class citizen, human but bestial, smart perhaps but not evolved, part of a shapeless mass of unfortunate barbaric creatures that hovered on the per periphery of his consciousness. Surely, if there had ever been an exception to the rule, it was Lucy Gray Baird, a person who uh, who defied easy definition, a rare bird just like him. Why else had the pressure of of her lips on his turn his knees into water? So, kind of a backhanded compliment. I don't know. Just shows how like deeply ingrained in a. Uh, Corio, this idea of people from the districts being like subhuman like he can only kind of see Lucy Gray as a person because he's attracted to her which is gross anyway finally it's a day of the games so Coriolanus uh, walks over to the Capitol News for a pre-show and only the mentors who participated in interview night are invited for this one uh, Gall and Highbottom are there shocker uh, Gall, of course, uh, mocks Corio, saying stuff like how Lucy Gray won't last the day, and then he replies with Lucy Gray's line about the Mockingjay singing, which uh, confuses Gall in high bottom, and he enjoys the confusion. So then we learn that the boy from District 5 has died the previous night from complications due to asthma, which sucks, but hey, now Lucy Gray only has uh, 13 competitors. Uh, so when it's time for the pre for the pre-show, uh, Coriolanus kind of has an advantage because he has new material to work with since most of, well, pretty much all of Lucy Gray's interview have been dedicated to her song. So he can talk about her background more instead of rehashing old material like most of the other mentors. And Lucky even lets him go over time. And Coriolanus sells uh, Lucy Gray on, like, not really being district and points out how at home she seems in the capital. And this kind, of, this kind of got me thinking. This might be a weird side tangent, but whatever. Um, 
So I'm going to jump ahead into events in the book. So uh, spoiler alert, um, it's a reread podcast, so I hope you know events that happen in this book. Um, so we know that ultimately uh, Lucy Gray does end up winning the games. And I wonder if her victory really sells like the idea to some capital citizens that they are better than the people in the districts. Because Lucy Gray doesn't have the best odds going into the games. Uh, there's no real reason for anyone to think she'll win, but she does. I don't know, it might be, create this narrative on how the capital will always triumph, and since she's quote-unquote not really district, so of course she won in this weird narrative arc. Um, I don't know, it just further dehumanizes the tributes, especially because we're like seeing the origins of the games becomes this huge like show spectacle event thing and as we see by Katniss's time like citizens are just fully desensitized to the violence and the horror that's going on anyway just random thought I wanted to share so uh Lysistrata is annoyed with Coriolanus again same because uh, she's trying to sell the fact that uh, Jessup and Lucy Gray are allies and Corio isn't really working with her because he's just like so focused on elevating Lucy Gray above all the other tributes and that of course includes Jessup. Um, so after uh, Lucky interviews the mentors he then moves on to High Bottom and this interview is really interesting so I I'm going to read it out loud for you guys. This is on, uh, this starts on page uh, 199. The reason for Dean Highbottom's presence became clear when he followed on Lysistrata's heels. He managed to, to discuss the mentor tribute program as if he hadn't been drugged the entire time. Actually, Coriolanus found it a little unsettling how lucid some of his observations were. He noted that the capital students had begun with certain prejudices against their district counterparts, but in two... But in the two weeks since the reaping, many had formed a new appreciation and respect for them. It's essential, as they say, to know your enemy. So what better way to get to know each other than to join forces in the Hunger Games? The capital won the war only after a long, hard fight, and recently our arena was bombed. To imagine that on either side we lack intelligence, strength, or courage would be a mistake. But surely you're not comparing our children to theirs, said Lucky. One look tells you ours are, are a superior breed. One look tells you ours have had more food, nicer clothing, and better dental care, said Dean Highbottom. Assuming anything more, a physical, mental, or especially moral superiority would be a mistake. That sort of hubris almost finished us off in the war. Fascinating, said Lucky, seemingly for lack of a better response. Your views are absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Mr. Flickerman. I can think of no one whose opinion I value more, deadpan the dean. Coriolanus thought the dean's eye roll was implied, but Lucky blushed in response. That's very kind, Mr. Highbottom. As we all know, I am only a humble weatherman. So, I love this interview so much. Like, Highbottom directly calls out how ridiculous the Capitol's collective view of the districts are. Because he's 100% right. Uh, the Capitol desperately wants to believe that they are inherently better, but all they do have are just, you know, better resources because they're the ones in power. And it's really bold to do this on national TV. Like, this is a step up from Sejanus uh, calling out Dr. Gall in a classroom. So good, good for you, sir. Again, I just love how this book uh, keeps challenging our view of High Bottom because he's introduced to us as the creator of the Hunger Games. And, you know, when I think of that, I think of someone who's evil and twisted like Gall. Like, I didn't appreciate High Bottom's character enough the first time I read this book. And uh, mostly because I was too fixated on Lucy Gray. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the interview ends with Lucky doing a magic trick. Uh, he pulls a candy from behind High Bottom's ear. Because, uh, you know, can't end it on a controversial note. Uh, so they go back to the, to the academy where they'll watch the games. Uh, Coriolanus is stuck in a car with High Bottom. 
he reflects on on high bottoms interview and wonders why he shared such a quote unquote radical idea on national tv and he also hates the fact that high bottom did that because he sees it as diminishing his efforts to raise lucy gray above the other tributes so when they arrive at the academy we get a brief but interesting moment between a uh, choreo and high bottom so High Bottom tells uh, Coriolanus to make sure that Sejanus has a seat near the door. And I think this is the closest we get to seeing High Bottom, like, showing care towards someone. Because from that comment alone, I think it's safe to assume that High Bottom knows that Marcus has been captured and what's been done to him, which we're all going to see in a minute. And he knows it'll obviously upset Sejanus. Like, I don't think Highbottom necessarily cares about Sejanus. At most, I think he probably likes likes him better than most of the other students. Definitely more than Coriolanus. But I think we can see Highbottom's guilt manifesting here. Because we know from later in the book that he feels an incredible amount of guilt for his part in creating the Hunger Games. And Sejanus, originally being from the districts, could have ended up as being a tribute if his father wasn't so rich. So, in his mind, I think Sejanus represents the kids that High Bottom has essentially sentenced to death. He doesn't directly warn Sejanus about what's about to happen, since he doesn't want to face his guilt, but he very subtly, like, indirectly warns him through Coriolanus. Anyway, enough of me rambling. Time for another reading. So the passage I want to focus on is in the middle of page uh, 201. All right, so mm. it's, so this starts with, um, like, Lysistrata. Not Lysistrata. This starts with Satyria leading them through the hall. So she led them through the hall, which, unlike in previous years, was buzzing with excitement. People were shouting good luck to him, congratulating him on the interview, Coriolanus enjoyed the attention, but there was something undeniably disturbing about it as well. In the past, these had been subdued occasions, in which people avoided eye contact and spoke only when necessary. Now an eagerness filled the hall, as if, as if a much-loved entertainment awaited them. So, so it's interesting, because even uh, Coriolanus can recognize kind of the jarring shift in attitude for the games this year. And it's crazy how quickly the shift happened as well, because just a few weeks ago, the Hunger Games were still generally viewed as this unpleasant thing that no one really wanted to watch. Um, but now, uh, people are starting to get excited about it, like it's a sporting event. And glad you have enough awareness to see that choreo. It's uh, too bad you'll contribute to making things much worse in the future. So, mentors, uh, they get their communicuffs, which are basically just these uh, devices they'll use to send gifts to their tributes in the arena. Uh, Corio and Lysistrata agree to help each other send food to both uh, Lucy Gray and Jessup. And Lysistrata's anxiety is growing, understandably. And there's a really interesting conversation she and Coriolanus have on page uh, 202. So, starting at the end of a paragraph where Lissa Strada asks, How long do you do we have to keep dragging the war out? I think Dr. Gall believes forever, he said, like she told us in class. It's not just her. Look at everybody. She indicated to the party-like atmosphere of the room. It's revolting. Coriolanus tried to calm her. My cousin said to remember this isn't of our making, that we were still children too. That doesn't help somehow. Uh, being used like this, said Lysistrata sadly, especially when three of us are dead. Used? Coriolanus had never thought of being a mentor as anything but an honor, a way to serve the capital and perhaps gain a little glory. But she had a point. If the cause wasn't honorable, how could it be an honor to participate in it? He felt confused, then manipulated, then un undefended, as if he were more a tribute than a mentor. Uh, so, yeah. 
like Katniss points out later in the series, um, they're all essentially slaves to the capital, no matter how privileged. Anyway, uh, he and Lysistrata get seats toward the back. Uh, Lucky's on screen giving background information on each district, uh, reports on the weather, and does a couple more magic tricks. Uh, Lysistrata calls him an idiot. Um, wonder what she'll think of Caesar in the future. And then we get an appearance from Clementia. What? She's back. So she heads straight for uh, Coriolanus after getting her communa cup, and she's not happy with him. She snaps at him, in fact, and wondering, like, why he didn't come to visit her, why he didn't tell her parents where she was. And he, of course, makes up excuses. Uh, Lysistrata tries to calm Clemencia down, tells her that no one was allowed to see her. And Lysistrata tried to make the effort because, you know, she's a good person and a genuine friend. Unlike you, Corio. Uh, Festus also joins them and tries to calm Clemencia down. But in the end, she storms off and sits in the front row. Uh, Coriolanus waves Sejanus over and notes that he's looking unwell, even a bit feverish. And Lysistrata tries to comfort him, saying it'll all be over soon, but Sejanus just replies with, until next year, and, I mean, he's right. And the overall mood is, like, kind of anxiety-inducing. Like, Lysistrata, like, she kind of reflects how I was feeling for the first time when I read this, because... As you guys know, I love Lucy Gray. Uh, we didn't know whether she was going to live or die. And a popular theory that was going around in the time leading up to Ballad's release was that Coriolanus would fall in love with the girl from 12. She would die in the games and this would be what triggers him going down his dark path. I, I personally leaned more towards a theory that she would win and be District 12's first victor. <laughs> Glad I was right. Uh, but still, it, it was a reasonable theory So, to assume that Lucy Gray might die. So I was very nervous watching, to, not watching, I was nervous reading this for the first time. So, I know this episode has been pretty, like, uh, reading heavy, but I can't help it. Like I said, um, blame Suzanne for being a good writer. So I'm going to read the last bit of the chapter because the games are about to begin. When Lucky Flickerman returned and extended his hand in a welcoming gesture, Coriolanus could see the bright candy smear from the magic trick in his palm. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, let the 10th Hunger Games begin. A wide shot of the arena's interior replaced Lucky. The 14 tributes who remained on... His list were positioned in a large circle, awaiting for the opening gong. No one paid any attention to them or to the new wreckage from the bombing that littered the field or to the weapons strewn in the dusty ground or to the flag of Pan Am strung from the stands, adding to the unprecedented decorative touch to the arena. All eyes moved with the camera, riveted as it slowly zoomed in to the pair of steel poles not far from the main entrance of the arena. They were 20 feet high, joined by a cross beam of similar length. At the center of the structure, Marcus hung from, from Manalee's wrist, so battered and bloody that at first Coriolanus thought they were displaying his corpse. Then Marcus's swollen lips began to move, showing his broken teeth and leaving little to doubt that he was still alive. Once again, the Capitol is just showing how horrible they are. And on that pleasant note, uh, we've come to the end of the episode. Uh, next week, we'll see the games officially start and digest everything that just happened with that ending. Uh, spoiler alert, Sejanus does not take it well. I don't take it well. So thank you so much uh, for listening. I hope you enjoyed the uh, performance I gave earlier in this episode. And don't forget to follow, subscribe. That way you get notified when future episodes come out. Uh, next week uh, we'll be talking about chapters 14 to 16. Uh, you can send your thoughts 
by messaging me on Instagram at bookishbabbles underscore podcast or by emailing me uh, bookishbabbles1618 at gmail.com. That'll be in the show notes. Um, Hope you guys have a great day, night, whenever you're listening to this, and I will chat with you next time. Bye!